Hi folks, welcome to another Legal Minute here on RTC TV 4. Today I'm joined by Andy Perkins, one of the partners here. And uh, Andy, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, I'd like to talk about the appellate process today, appeals, okay. and how, how that all works. Okay, so uh, appeal. If you don't like the decision, you come back and ask somebody to review it, right? Right. The Indiana Court of Appeals uh, involves 15 judges, and they're divided into three judge panels. Okay. And those panels rotate. So if a local court makes a decision that I don't like, I can appeal it to the Court of Appeals. Uh, I, I don't get to choose which of the three judges on the panel I get. Uh, their job is to uh, review it and issue an opinion. Uh, I think they issue more than 2,500 opinions a year. Really? Uh, unlike a lot of other states, everyone in Indiana has a right to a direct appeal. That okay. is, in some states, the appellate court can simply refuse to hear your case. In really? Indiana, the appellate court uh, will hear the case uh, at least on paper, and that's a distinction a lot of people don't realize about the appellate process. When you're in front of the Court of Appeals, there are no witnesses, there are no juries, you know, you, you don't try a case in front of the Court of Appeals, you're asking the Court of Appeals to review a case that was tried to the local courts, and there are essentially uh, two ways to do that. One is to ask them to ap appeal a final decision, take a jury verdict, for example, and, and the court accepts the verdict, enters judgment, uh, then that matter at the local court is final, and you can certainly appeal appeal that. But there's also a process called an uh, interlocutory appeal, which is essentially some decision by the, by the local court, or we call the trial court, some decision by the trial court in the midst of the case that you want reviewed uh, by the higher court. Okay. You can, uh, there are certain of those you have a right to a direct appeal uh, on, there are certain of those you have to ask the trial court for permission to go up and appeal it, um, but I, I find that what people uh, get wrong the most about an appeal is they, one, they don't understand the difference between what's on the record and what's not on the record, okay. and number two, uh, uh, they often don't understand the difference between reviewing the decision of a local court and making the decision anew. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. the, the record is a transcript of everything that was said at the trial, all the witnesses, all the attorneys, and, and what the judge said, plus all the evidence. When you, when you watch TV and you hear them talk about Exhibit A, Exhibit B, mm -hmm. uh, those, if, if they're properly uh, marked and, and brought into record by the judge, those become part of the record. So okay. you, have, you have all that, and plus all the motions and orders filed by, by the court. Um, the Court of Appeals is limited by what is in the record. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if I, had a, if I had a trial, let's say, about a car accident case, and I, I uh, said, well, I want to appeal it because the jury and the judge found uh, in the other guy's favor, and I say to my lawyer, I want to appeal it because I told my lawyer about wit witness Mr. Smith who lives down in Kokomo, and my lawyer didn't call Mr. Smith as a witness. There's a problem with that appeal because it's like proving a negative. Right. Uh, Mr. Smith did not become a witness, therefore you can't appeal the fact that he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, the record is very important on, on an appeal, particularly when you think about the mechanics of an appeal involve both lawyers researching and writing written briefs, written arguments about uh, uh, about why the Court of Appeals should decide A or B. Um, there may be oral arguments, depending on if anyone requests it, but most appeals don't have an oral argument. Mm -hmm. Most are done on paper. And so if you're doing it entirely on paper, uh, then the Court of Appeals has to look at a written record. Mm -hmm. And one sentence uh, that, in one variation or another, the Court of Appeals is very common of saying is, we're not here to judge the credibility of witnesses or to reweigh the evidence. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Court of Appeals is not just answering the question, would, me, would we have made a different decision? Mm -hmm. They're really usually answering the question, did the decision happen in an unfair mm -hmm. environment? That is, did the judge make an improper legal decision mm -hmm. that affected the fairness of the trial? So. 
uh, I, I think that's hard for, for a lot of people facing the appellate decision. Sure. What they want is a different decision on the outcome, okay. uh, and the Court of Appeals is generally not in the business of saying, we're going to hear the same evidence and see if we would have made the same decision. Mm -hmm. But they are in the business of saying, uh, for example, we don't think the trial judge should have let that guy testify, mm -hmm. or we don't think the trial judge got the law right when he uh, allowed these jur jury instructions instead of these jury instructions. Mm -hmm. So it's very much a law versus facts mm -hmm. world. Uh, when you take it to the Court of Appeals, you're better off having a law issue uh, mm -hmm. than a fact issue. Right. Uh, it just, it just uh, it, the Court of Appeals generally is more receptive to that. So are they looking at... They're, Based on what I've just heard, it sounds like they're looking more at the process and what came in through that process rather than retrying the case itself. I think that's very fair. That's a very good way to put it. Um, there, there are some exceptions where where the Court of Appeals has a has a special power to look into the substance of a decision. Okay. For example, in criminal sentencing, uh, there's a, a rule called uh, uh, Appellate Rule Seven. Uh, B and under that rule, the Court of Appeals, just on its own, can say, "I know you sentenced him to 20 years, but we think 16 is better," and they they can evaluate that. The Latin term is de novo. They can just evaluate that because they're the Court of Appeals, and, mm -hmm. and they don't they don't need to say it was a mistake of law for mm -hmm. the judge to do it that way. Um, that's one of the few exceptions. By and large, uh, they're looking at the way the, the process was done, and if it was done within the bounds of the law, uh, uh, they tend not to upset the decision that was made. Another thing the Court of Appeals can do, the Court of Appeals can recognize a mistake was made and then allow the de decision to stand anyway, finding that the court, uh, trial court's mistake was not serious enough to change the outcome of the trial. Mm -hmm. It happens sometimes in criminal appeals. So, so they found a, a, a mistake of law, if you will, but that mistake of law, they can make the decision that it didn't change the outcome or wouldn't have. Correct. The phrase is uh, harmless error. That is, interesting. yep, that, you're, you're right. My kids use harmless <laughs> error all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time. That's right. Well, Dad, I know <laughs> but, I didn't do my homework, but I still got an A on that test. Right. It was harmless error. Yeah, that's interesting. A, I like that defense. Yeah, I think right? your kids should go to law school. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Sorry to interrupt. Please. No, that's fine. Um, so I, I think one of the one of the key things to understand is that law versus facts, and is this is this not only a mistake the the lower court made? Mm -hmm. Is it is it a mistake worthy of taking up on appeal? Because it's an investment to take something up on an appeal. It takes mm -hmm. time. Uh, Indiana is actually faster than most states when it comes to issuing a written opinion. Uh, from the time, a little bit about the mechanics of it. From the time I decide I want to appeal a de decision, mm -hmm. I have 30 days from the date. Let's assume I'm working on a final decision, not a not an interlocutory appeal. Mm -hmm. I have 30 days from that date to file a notice of appeal. Okay. That starts the court reporter and the uh, 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 the clerk doing some things that they need to do. Mm -hmm. And once that is done, a process that's supposed to take uh, 45 days from the date my notice is filed. Once that is done, uh, I have 30 days to file a written brief, which is my formal argument. Okay. Laying, laying out what's there. And then the other side has an opportunity to file a brief, and I have an opportunity to file a brief reply to that brief. And, you know, before you know it, that's four months mm -hmm. that have gone by. Right. And the, and the Court of Appeals hasn't really even considered the case yet. Right. And, and by which I mean intellectually considered it. They, they've, they've got a file down there uh, in Indianapolis, but, but they don't start sitting with the panel and have, mm -hmm. reading it, having their clerks read it. Um, until uh, uh, quite a bit of time has passed. And so people who want to appeal decision are, are investing probably between six and ten months in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it's a, if it's a pretty straightforward now, appeal. Now, this time that you're talking about six to ten months, that's because of all of the uh, logistics that have to happen. It's, it's not because we're backed up in appellate courts, or is it? No, I don't think so. I I, I don't know what the uh, what last year's uh, statistics were for the, the Court of Appeals, uh, but uh, generally, uh, uh, the Court of Appeals will get decisions out once it's fully briefed. Mm -hmm. They're usually, in my experience, going to get a decision out probably within, you know, uh, 
two to four months. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, they can take longer. Uh, they can uh, uh, take as long as they want because they are the Court of Appeals. And there are, I mean, this is, quite frankly, could be tens of thousands of cases in the state of Indiana being tried and adjudicated every year yeah. that every one of those, based on Indiana law, they have the right to an appeal. Correct. Wow. Correct. There are small claims cases that get appealed. There are property tax determinations uh, that then get appealed to a trial court after the, the Board of Assessment and then go on to uh, uh, the tax court. Indiana has a, an appellate level court it's kind of unique just for tax issues. Interesting. So if I if I appeal uh, uh, almost anything else, it goes to the Court of Appeals. If I appeal a tax issue, it goes to this tax court. And uh, if I appeal, there are a couple of uh, uh, issues uh, like the death sentence, mm -hmm. uh, death penalty appeal. Sure. If I appeal that, that by rule goes directly to the, to the Supreme Court. Um, so of so, Indiana. Of Indiana, yes, I'm sorry, of Indiana. Now, if because I'm, I'm sure, and this isn't <laughs> to degrade anyone, but the the judicial system in America is vast and it's very large, and we hear the Supreme Court of the United States getting all of the publicity, if you will. Sure, there are many people who don't know that there is a Supreme Court of the state of Indiana. All states, I believe, have them, or most. Uh, all states, all states have a a, a final court. Mm. Uh, some some have different names right. uh, for that final court. Uh, Unlike the Court of Appeals in Indiana, Indiana Supreme Court does not have to hear your case. Mm. Okay, if I if I go through the appellate process, I don't like the decision of the Court of Appeals, I can file what's called a petition to transfer, which is basically asking the Supreme Court to take the case. Uh, they're not obligated to do that, um, and uh, uh, they if they do it, consider yourself fortunate. That's a pretty small percentage right. uh, of cases that they will take on. Um, because they have a full docket, they do. Planned out they have the a lot of cases. I, uh, uh, they numerically they don't hear as many as the the court of appeals. Uh, at the same time, uh, they uh, have oral arguments. I believe on every case they take, or almost every case they take. Uh, there are only five of them, and not fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have other duties uh, in the state of Indiana constitutionally. They're responsible for the oversight of all the judges and all yes. the lawyers. So they have uh, other duties that that uh, uh, don't involve hearing cases mm -hmm. that the Court of Appeals doesn't have. And so those numbers change a little bit when you go to the, the Indiana State Supreme Court. But um, we've had the system we have now with appellate judges since uh, the Indiana Constitution was amended in 1972. Okay. Um, judges are... Uh, uh, Appointed, but they're subject to a retention vote, mm -hmm. uh, and so the, we see them on our ballots, and we don't know who the judge is. Right, I, I get that question a lot. Uh, <laughs> are there going to be any judges on the ballot, and what should I do, and that kind of thing? Um, and uh, uh, some states uh, have that uh, model, and have had. Uh, I think Missouri a few years ago uh, actually uh, caused some. Uh, folks to be removed from their Supreme Court really? based on that uh, kind of a system. But um, Indiana has never removed uh, an appellate or I think a Supreme Court judge either really? under that system. Uh, but it, it, it is an attempt to balance keeping someone out of uh, the political fray right. with some accountability. Right. And uh, I don't think you're never, ever going to find a perfect system mm. among those. But uh, Well, this is very interesting. Again, uh, we're here on the Legal Minute. Um, you know, we're going to have to change the name of this to the Legal Brief or something else because <laughs> we keep going past a couple of minutes. But right. uh, again, Andy Perkins here, Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins LLP here in Rochester, mm -hmm. talking about the appellate court process. So how often does a guy from Rochester, Indiana, an attorney mm -hmm. who's had a case, get a decision that the... Um, the defendant, if, if you will, or even, I guess, the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. um, it could be civil or criminal. Right. Yeah. Appeals. How often does that lawyer from Rochester, Indiana, end up in front of the Supreme Court of Indiana doing oral arguments? Not too often. Uh, I've done it twice uh, since I started practicing in Or even the appeals court. Even the appeals yeah, I, court. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've been in front of the state Supreme Court doing oral arguments twice, and actually none of the appeals I've done directly to the Court of Appeals right. have yet been been called with oral called for okay. oral arguments. And by oral arguments, we're talking about you standing in front of 
the bench right. and, and discussing, if you will, with uh, under Robert's rules of order, so to speak, the well, back and forth. If you could think back to your high school debate class, yes, uh, we have lights on the podium. It's it's a little bit like that. Okay, but uh, I think I think most of what decides an appellate decision mm -hmm. is a combination of what's in that record and what's in the briefs of the attorneys. Mm -hmm. I think the oral argument is there to kind of hash out some some particular questions the mm -hmm. court the the judges or in this supreme court justices uh may have about the record itself okay. uh you don't walk into an oral argument raising an argument you didn't raise in your brief mm -hmm. you know you're there to, to yeah, summarize don't, don't bring in new no no <laughs> they don't they don't want to hear anything new and uh um uh, traditionally uh, not too many lawyers get all the way through their prepared comments because you know, the, the, an appellate court can interrupt you at any time right. and ask you anything they want. Because they're looking for specifics. They want one piece of information. And sure. You may fluff it on both the front and the back, but they want that just in the middle, and if they can get that, they may shut you down. That's right. That's yeah, right. They certainly can. So. Well, it's a fascinating um, subject. It's a fascinating field that you guys are in, and I'm, I'm learning quite a bit here. I may be a paralegal by the time we're done <laughs> with Great. these interviews, but... Um, the appellate court of Indiana. Uh, anything else you want to talk about with the appellate court or the appellate process? Just remember to think ahead. Um, okay. That 30 days after the decision moves pretty quickly. Yeah. If if you think that uh, you want to appeal something, don't let it sit. I, I've even had uh, consultations with people before their trial mm -hmm. where they said, we want to lay the groundwork for an appeal. Mm -hmm. Are there certain things we could do at the trial that, if we're unsuccessful at the trial level, would would improve our chances on appeal? So you you, you don't have to even wait until uh, a negative decision right. to to start that preparation. Hedging process. your bets, if you will, as you go through the process. Sure, I mean everybody who looks at a lawsuit um, needs to seriously consider, no matter how good their case is. What if it doesn't go our way? Right. I mean, that's that's one reason a lot of cases settle. It's the risk of the unknown, and so uh, the appellate court's no different. In some ways, you're kind of upping the ante because mm -hmm. uh, you're investing even more in something, and so it's not a process I would ever advise someone to, to take on lightly, mm -hmm. uh, or or certainly not a process they should uh, um, tarry on or or, uh, or wait before acting. So let more. me ask you this question that's just come to mind, and, and maybe this is pertinent. If I have a lawyer A mm -hmm. represent me in a case, mm -hmm. the case is the decision does not go my way. Mm -hmm. I do want an appeal, but I want to change horses midstream, so to speak, and I want to come to Peterson Wagoner and Perkins. Can you then take the appeal onward? Yes. In fact, most of the appeals that I do, I was not the trial. Attorney. Okay. That's that's very. It was a good question. Yeah, it was a good question. <laughs> that that does happen. Frequently, sometimes I know a lot of very good trial attorneys who just don't want to do appeals. Yeah, they just that's just not part of their their wheelhouse, and they don't want to take the time and so they learn the off rules. to the next step if they want. Sure, and and uh, very often one of the first things I do in an appeal is I want to talk to the trial attorney. Sure, I, I want to do some issue spotting and see what what things at the trial were strange mm -hmm. or did they did they make objections for uh, that we could uh, uh, we could kind of hash out in the appeal process. What a fascinating, fascinating system we have here. And and again, it's um, you might not feel like it's justice, but it is justice in the end that we're doing our best, especially with the appellate process. Sure. Not every trial can go smoothly and hunky-dory with A, B, C, we're done. Right. There's a lot of convolution to these things. Um, a lot of variables at work. A lot of variables at work. And yeah. so uh, it's nice to know that in our law... Um, folks have come around to say there's a system by which we'll make sure that we're giving you the best opportunity possible. One final question, how many times can one appeal? Is well, there a limit? Yeah, the 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 process of uh, of the appeal um, and here I'll differentiate the the direct appeal mm -hmm. is usually what we're talking about. And and for a direct appeal, the system is designed so you so that you get one you get one chance to appeal it. That 30 days to file the notice, once that 30 days is, is over, an attempt to uh, uh, appeal that is designed to get rejected. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there, there, you can file special motion for sure. related appeal and certain, but in terms of the direct appeal process, it's designed so that you get just the one. Okay. Now, there are situations where returning a question to the court is permissible, for example, in cases where there's a fraud on the court, mm -hmm. uh, where, where someone says, uh, you know, I, I could not bring this up on direct appeal because I didn't know that witness number seven uh, lied. I now can prove he lied. Mm -hmm. Again, probably with things outside the record. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, there's a different process for, for addressing that mm -hmm. that is not what I would call appeal. Mm -hmm. But some people may consider it that. But as, for, as far as a direct appeal is concerned, it's designed so that you get one. Okay. Very yeah. good. Very good. Well, we'll make it count. Uh, again, here uh, with Andy Perkins, Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins here in Rochester. Fascinating stuff, Andy. I appreciate your time. Folks, if you have questions about this, this is what they specialize in. I, it fascinates me that you are quoting me earlier a rule of law that was Article 4, Subsection C, <laughs> third note. Well, it comes in practice. It does. Right. And, and the amount of information that you truly have to store in your heads. It's not just look it up on the internet. You have to have precedence. You have to have these things memorized in order to simply function in your profession. It's amazing. So oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you. Happy to come talk about it, Scott. We'll talk again. Again, Scott Sager, RTC TV4. You're watching The Legal Minute. See you next time.